The strategy pattern is one of my favorites from the original Gang of Four Design Patterns book. It's easy to understand, it's widely applicable, and it's really closely related to software design principles that are generally just good to follow anyway. So today, we're going to see why the strategy pattern is helpful, we're going to see how to implement a traditional strategy pattern in Kotlin, and then we're going to see how Kotlin's language features can put a modern spin on it. So let's start by looking at some code that's just asking for the strategy pattern. I've got here a simple model representing a form field, and the field has a name and a value. And we've got this function here that can be used to tell us whether the value is valid for this field. And since different kinds of form fields contain different kinds of values, like an email, a username, or a password, we might implement one form field for each of those types. So for example, here we've got an email field that will ensure that the value includes at least an at sign and a dot character. So we've got a different class for each kind of value that the field could hold. And that's great, but the kind of value is only one dimension here. What happens when another dimension comes along? So for example, what if we also need to add the ability to support both required and optional form fields? Well, one approach might be to add an optional version of each one of these classes, and here's what that would look like. Well, now we've got three kinds of values, email, username, and password, and two levels of requirement. So we end up with three times two for a total of six classes. And you can see how this can cause a combinatorial explosion of classes, especially if we were to add yet a third dimension. So let's backpedal to our original code. We'll put all this required and optional business aside for now and let's implement a traditional strategy pattern so that our code has the points of articulation where we need them. You might have heard the expression encapsulate what varies, and I found a lot of developers get tripped up on that expression, so for today, I'm going to say extract what differs. So let's look again at the three classes from our original code and consider the things that are different between them. There are two things that change among these classes. The first is the name, it's email here, username here, and password here. And the second is the body of the isValid function. So the email is checking to make sure it's got an at sign and a dot, the username just makes sure that it's not empty, and the password field ensures that it's at least eight characters long. Let's focus on the second of these two, the logic for how to validate each field. And since this logic is different, among these classes, let's extract that validation logic to its own interface and classes. So to start with, we can create a new interface called validator. We'll just give it a function named isValid, and we'll accept the value that it's going to validate. And next we can create an implementing class for each of the three kinds of validation logic that's currently baked into the form field classes. So one for email, one for username, and one for password. We can just copy and paste the body of the function out of the form field classes and into the validator classes. We can add a private validator constructor property to each of the form field classes. And finally, each of the form field implementations can just delegate its isValid function to that validator property. And now the only thing that's different between these three classes is the name. And it's certainly easy to extract a simple value. We just lift it into the constructor like this. And now, when we look at these three classes, the only difference between them is the name of the class itself. So we can consolidate them into a single class. And we could even eliminate the interface if we want. Or we can keep it if you want the flexibility. And with this code, you're looking at a traditional strategy pattern. In design patterns parlance, the form field class is known as the context, and this validator interface is known as the strategy. And each of the three classes that implement that interface is a concrete strategy. 
Now, in just a moment, we're going to see how we can use some Kotlin language features to improve this even further. But before we do that, let's consider the changes that we've already made. So we looked over our original code and we identified the things that differed among the classes. And then we extracted those things from those classes and passed them in through the constructor. And by doing this, we ended up with only one form field class and three validator classes plus the validator interface. Now, if you're like Mr. Grumpy Recalcitrant Man, you might be saying, Dave, we go from three classes in one ISNR face to four classes in one ISNR face. How this better? Well, we are about to improve this further, but there's more to consider than just the number of types. For example, with these changes, we've narrowed the focus of each class, and you've probably heard of the single responsibility principle, and that's partly what we've achieved here. And that gives us flexibility in a few different ways. So for example, we can use these validators in places other than form field objects. And we can add a new validator very easily because there's only one function to implement. And of course, we can test the validators in complete isolation from form fields or anything else. Now, this works just fine, but it doesn't really feel like Kotlin. So let's try to keep the essence of the strategy pattern, but apply it with some Kotlin language features that'll make it more expressive. In more traditional object-oriented languages, classes are king of the hill and functions are just kind of tagging along for the ride. But in Kotlin, functions can be declared apart from classes, and so classes and functions are pretty much on equal footing. So it feels a bit heavy-handed in Kotlin to have a separate class for each of these validators, especially since they only have a single function and no state. So we can replace each of these classes with a simple variable that is assigned a lambda. Because this validator interface includes a single abstract method, or SAM, we can just create new validators with a lambda like this. Just be sure to add the fun keyword to the interface. We might also decide that we don't even need this interface at all. So we might just say that anything that accepts a string and returns a Boolean could fit the definition of a validator. If so, we can just omit our interface and use the string to Boolean type. Or we could create a type alias to help communicate our intent a little bit more. And now that we've got this design, we can gracefully add the ability to support optional form fields. We won't have to create a second version of each validator. All we have to do is create a function that can wrap an existing validator like this. So if the value is empty, then the validator will return true. Otherwise, we'll run the original validator. Now, when reading this code, be careful to note that this is actually a function with an expression body, not a block body. So in other words, this function doesn't return a Boolean, it returns a function. And we can apply it down here like this. And with this, we've got the essence of the strategy pattern, but we're taking advantage of Kotlin's first class functions, type aliases, and extension functions to make it more expressive. Now there's some flexibility in how you apply design patterns. And with the strategy pattern, you might extract the strategy to a constructor argument like we did here, but you could also riff on the idea in other ways. So for example, the context class might choose from among multiple strategies at runtime, or you could make it so that the calling code could replace the strategy at runtime. The context class might pass its entire reference to the strategy instead of an individual member. And those changes, wouldn't really make sense for the example code in this video, but I mentioned them because I want to emphasize that you don't have to implement the exact UML from the original design patterns book in order to use a pattern. It's fine to adapt them to meet whatever different quality objectives you've got for your project. Now, before we wrap up this video, I hope you got a chance to join me for the first episode of the Type Alias Show live stream a few weeks back. It was a lot of fun. We caught up on a lot of the latest Kotlin news, we got to take a look at the new kotlinx.rpc library. I got to answer some of your questions. Lots of fun. But don't worry, if you weren't able to be there, you can still catch it on replay. I'll include a link to that in the description. Now, I'm already looking forward to the next live stream. I'm still working on locking down the day. It'll probably be in a few weeks. 
the best way that you can stay looped in on those plans is to join the hundreds of other Kotlin developers who have signed up for my email newsletter. You can sign up at newsletter.typealias.com, and that way you'll be among the first to know about all the fun things I've got up my sleeves. Thanks again for hanging out with me today, and I will see you next time.